What do GPs need to know about diabetic neuropathy? What can they do to safeguard their own well-being? And what's a good way to remember the causes of delirium? We'll be discussing these questions in this episode of the Clinical Update podcast. I'm Dawn Liz Powell and I'm your host for today. With me in the studio are my colleagues Pat Anderson and Rhiannon Ashman. Shortly, they will be reviewing a module that has been very popular with our readers, Understanding Painful Diabetic Neuropathy. As well as looking at why the module has been so popular, they will talk about diagnosing and managing the condition. Then, Pat will be speaking to an award-winning resilience trainer, Dr. Farna Sharif, about GP wellbeing. And for our final segment, we will bring you three key things you need to know about delirium. Over to you, Pat and Rhiannon. So, Pat, I'm imagining that a lot of our listeners working in primary care have got um, big caseloads of patients with diabetes. Uh, Why is painful diabetic neuropathy something that they would need to learn more about? Well, it's a big problem. Obviously, lots of people have diabetes and up to 50 percent of those people develop polyneuropathy and about 20 percent develop painful diabetic neuropathy. So Dr. Mick Serpel, who's a pain management consultant in Glasgow and has written this module about painful diabetic neuropathy, has lots of experience of uh, dealing with patients with this condition. And he sets out some of the impact. He says it causes morbidity, disability, um, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders. And interestingly, apparently there's increased death from cardiovascular disease among patients who have painful diabetic neuropathy as compared to those who have painless diabetic neuropathy and the pain may be described as prickling burning stabbing or an electric sensation people can lose muscle strength their foot muscles may atrophy and polyneuropathy is the primary risk factor for the development of foot ulcers so there's a real opportunity to address pain and potential disability in a substantial number of patients so it does sound like it would affect a really significant number of a lot of our listeners' patients. Could you tell me more about how this module would help our listeners to identify their patients with painful diabetic neuropathy? Well, uh, Dr. Sir Pell is experienced at teaching other clinicians and he provides what seems to me some really practical advice. So, for example, in a table, he lays out a stepwise approach to diagnosis that starts with history taking, goes on to examination and confirmatory tests... Um, There are questions you can ask yourself as a clinician, such as the distribution of the pain. Does it fit with the pattern that you would expect to see with this condition, which is often a stocking or glove distribution? And he talks about using screening tools and sets out what these are, although he says there's no substitute for a really good examination. And he sets out what should be in that physical examination as well. So does the module cover management as well? It does. And apparently there's three pillars of management, according to Dr. Sapel. Um, one is glycemic control, another is foot care, and another one is symptomatic pain management. I was interested to read that the evidence for the benefit of glucose control on reducing the risk of diabetic neuropathy is not as strong for type 2 diabetes as it is for type 1. So Dr. Sapel goes on to say that if you institute aggressive glycemic control and try and aim too quickly for targets that are too low, then you're going to obviously increase the risk of severe hypoglycemia. But, and this is the bit I didn't know, that this in turn can lead to treatment-induced neuropathy. So I'm sure GPs probably know that, but I thought it was a really interesting point. Um, And foot care is vitally important to avoid the risk of infection and necrosis with foot ulcers. And for any nurses listening, they'll be extremely familiar with the care needs around foot and leg ulcers and how substantial and long-lasting those can be. And what was the third pillar? And the third pillar is pharmacological pain management. So Dr. Serpel sets out a tra- table of treatment options based on the latest guidelines and other evidence. And basically, he says first-line treatment should be one of three options, which are tricyclic antidepressants, SNRIs, or gabapentin or pregabalin. And our GP advisor fed back to me after reading this module that that was really good advice. And Dr. Serpel talks about other agents that aren't 
so much in the guidelines, but that he has evidence for. And these include some insights into the effectiveness of topical agents, for example. And that all seems like really useful stuff, I think. So I think um, from looking at the module feedback, it's obviously been incredibly popular with our audience. Um, I read a couple of the comments that healthcare professionals had left that said... Um, Painful diabetic neuropathy is not adequately treated or managed in my practice and my clinical experience. And this module has given me some more options. And someone else said, lots of patients are suffering from painful diabetic neuropathy, but most of them are undiagnosed and untreated. So why do you think this module has been so popular with our readers, Pat? Well, judging by those comments, I think this is an area where there are unmet needs among patients and also educational needs among healthcare professionals. And so that's what we're trying to do with our learning modules to meet those needs. And particularly with this one, where, as our learners have said, there are there's definitely scope for um, improvements. Thanks, Pat and Rhiannon. As a reminder, the module is on our website and is actually part of a wider learning plan we have on diabetes related complications. Now on to our interview in which Pat talks to Dr. Farnar Sharif. I'm delighted to have with me today Dr. Farnaz Sharif, who's a award-winning resilience trainer for GPs, and she's a former medical director uh, with GP background. And she's recently hosted a webinar for us about resilience and well-being, which went down really well and encouraged a lot of participation. So welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Hi, Pat. Yes, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be having this conversation with you. Lovely, thank you. So um, today we're going to talk about GP resilience and well-being. Could you first of all tell us a bit about your background and yourself? Sure. Well, I, I, I work as a as a GP. I have done for several years, and I've had quite a portfolio actually. So I've I've had various leadership roles within the NHS. These have varied from clinical advisory roles. Back in CCG days, I was elected onto the governing body. Um, as well as a, as a member there. I worked a lot around mental health, around local care, um, also representing the sort of primary care perspective um, across um, Medway at the time. And that role sort of evolved um, when the NHS landscape was changing um, and I served as medical director for just under three years uh, across Medway and Swale. And again, that was really about supporting our clinical directors um, with their primary care networks and then representing the primary care and the clinical perspective um, across our emerging health and care partnership. Great. And what got you into the field of resilience and wellbeing training? Being in, in leadership positions, actually, you know, working on the front lines as well. There's so many different responsibilities that I've had to juggle. Um, and like a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the teams that I've worked with, I, you know, I really wanted to do the job well, um, do the job exceptionally well, actually, serving our patients and strengthening our teams. And the work never ends. There's, there's always something to deal with. The pressures are there. The pressures are relentless. And I experienced firsthand the toll that it takes on my physical health. So I experienced the exhaustion, the tiredness. And also the toll that it takes mentally and emotionally, you know, the strain um, that it causes. So I very quickly, very early on in my career, actually realized how important it is for us to look after ourselves and the teams of people that we work with. I've been doing a lot of meditation, a lot of breath work for many, many years. Um, I know how it impacts on me mentally and emotionally. Um, I know what my life is like when I do do my practice, and I know what my life is like when I don't. So I, I make a concerted effort to accommodate that in my day, every day. Um, and I can see and feel the benefits of it in the job that I do. So if I was a GP working in the NHS at the moment, what characterises my kind of status in terms of personal well-being, do you think, at the moment? It seems to me it's a very, very stressful time for GPs. It is. I think it has been a stressful time for a very long time for, for GPs and for the sort of wider primary care workforce. I also think it's important to realise that the pressures 
are across the system. So a lot of our health and social care teams feel it as well. You know, folks working in mental health trusts, acute trusts, community trusts, that the, the pressures are really realized and felt across the system. But certainly from a primary care or a GP perspective, I know before the pandemic, the, there was a BMA survey that was done and they found that about a third of doctors, roughly a third of doctors who responded to the survey um, were experiencing burnout or very high risk of burnout. And these pressures were felt the most amongst doctors in an A&E setting and a primary care setting. So really the front line and the front line. Um, and now after the pandemic, the pressures across health and social care have increased dramatically. You know, there's a lot of staff that have left. There are a lot of workforce shortages. Um, those that are left behind are sort of working harder, much longer hours. I was speaking to a colleague yesterday um, who has done two consecutive 12-hour shifts in general practice. And then, of course, there's, there's lots of other pressures, funding pressures, challenges with IT, with estates. And all of these have adversely affected our wellness and contributed to increasing amounts of stress in the workplace, I feel. So what coping strategies do you find that the GPs who you train, what kind of coping strategies do they employ? It varies. You know, there's, there's no one size fits all when it comes to maintaining our, our well-being and our resilience in the workplace. Um, I think when, you know, when people don't feel good or when there's high levels of sort of stress and burnout, then, you know, we know that there's high absences because people can't go to work and understandably they need to rest. Um, but it does mean that those that are at work do feel that pressure slightly more um, and have to work longer or harder, perhaps. And that can sometimes translate to poorer outcomes for individuals, for teams, and sometimes even for patients. In terms of coping strategies, I, I think it varies depending on individuals and practices. Some, for example, might take frequent breaks. I know that there's some practices where they have health walks um, and they encourage people to step out of the practice, for, even if it's for half an hour during the day, just to get out, get some fresh air, get that change in the environment that really helps changing the things from a sort of physiological level. There's a lot of practices that offer staff fruit, um, you know, healthy snacks rather than unhealthy snacks, for example. Um, there's folks that have breaks between meetings, you know, they'll have a huddle in the morning, have a check-in with everyone, make sure that everyone's okay, they're very clear on what it is that they are doing for the day and if anybody needs any particular support, um, then they make sure that they get that. There's some practices I've spoken to where they have health and well-being champions, for example, um, or others that may have health and well-being as a regular agenda item so that the subject can be revisited every time the group is together and then they fine-tune their approach if needed depending on what staff's feedback is is like so these are some of the practical things that people take away with the health and well-being champion would that be a a gp or a nurse or who, who would it be within the practice who would fulfill that role I, I think it just depends. Um, and sometimes it's it's more um, the function of, of the health and wellbeing champion. So there are some GP colleagues of mine that play that role, clinical directors or GP partners that are there. And their role is really to create sort of safe spaces uh, for colleagues. They lead by example. Um, and if folks want to come in and sort of have, um, you know, a confidential conversation with them, they're very approachable, they're available, and they're able to do that. And in, in some instances, it is GPs or GP partners. In other instances, it may be the wider workforce. So it may be a practice manager or a practice nurse. Um, it could even be a pharmacist, for example. Where that interest lies, it's those particular um, individuals or uh, members of the team that take on that particular role. Would I be right in thinking it's more okay to be not okay in general practice than it used to be? I think people are certainly talking about it a lot more now than perhaps we were years ago. I know that there is a wellbeing module as part of the GP contract. And again, this, you know, this means different things for, for different people. But I think, you know, there is more of a shift and a focus on wellness, particularly mental wellness, 
Um, and there are more open, honest conversations about this in the workplace than there have been in the past. I've seen people also put their hands up and say, actually, I need to step away from this because I feel I need to look after myself. I know when I've had courses with receptionists in particular, and when they struggle with conversations sometimes, um, you know, there's certain things that we teach them they can do in the moment to help uh, look after themselves, but also it's about recognizing that actually this has been a very difficult uh, conversation for me. This has been very challenging for me. And it's about stepping up and saying, I need to step away just for a few minutes or a little bit longer, have a cup of tea, have a biscuit, go outside for a walk, have a conversation before I step back into that challenging environment. And certainly from people that, you know, been on our workshops, I think they are, they are doing that more and more. So are there sort of practical tips that you could give GPs and other healthcare professionals to to promote their own well-being um, in in the moment yes yeah we, we talked about this on the um, on, on the webinar right so there's there's lots of practical things um, that I found helpful and um, you know hopefully folks listening to this uh, may find helpful as well I think when it comes to practical tips I always look at um, what an individual can do, and then what a team or an organization or the workplace can do. So if we start with the individual, I think it's there's the four Fs, what I call the four Fs um, that folks need to be thinking about. The first is really how you feel yourself, you know, where you get your energy from, look at the kind of food that you're eating, make sure that it's healthy, um, make sure that you are eating um, and drinking well, because I know often in the workplace it can get so busy that you know you don't have time to stop to eat and drink properly and even if it's just for a few minutes making sure that you are having something that's likely to sustain you uh, whilst you deal with the responsibilities of the day is really important so how people fuel then how they refuel so how they recover from the challenges of the day you know what the quality of your sleep is like or your downtime is like and making sure that when you are taking a break from work at the end of the day you're not scrolling on your phone or replying to emails before you jump into bed um, or you know doing your prescriptions or checking your blood till early hours of the morning and make sure that you do get the rest that you need so that your mind is rested before you're, you're up and, and dealing with the challenges of the next day. So how you refuel or recover from the day is really, really important. And then our form, the state in which we deal with our challenges, right? So often if um, we're tired or exhausted, if we feel overwhelmed, psychologically our mind tends to withdraw because it may not want to be there. And then the body follows so often um, if, if we are feeling tired or overwhelmed or exhausted, then, you know, we sort of hunch downwards, we may frown, our shoulders droop, our chin is down, um, and we sort of tend to withdraw from a particular situation. And in that state, the energy doesn't flow very freely. So to change your form by, you know, grounding yourself, put your feet on the ground, have your spine nice and straight, your shoulders back, your chin up, physiologically allows you to embrace uh, the challenge, you know, the difficult conversation, the challenging meeting or whatever it is, rather than move away from it. And in that position, if you take a couple of, um, you know, deep breaths, there's a straw breath, there's a box breathing that are particularly useful in, in these kinds of situations. They really just help uh, calm the mind and uh, allow us to control our emotions rather than let the emotion control us. So our fuel, how we refuel our form, and then what we focus on um, when we're dealing with a crisis is incredibly important as well. So it sounds as though that's something you, that you could do with, between patients then. If you've just got that minute, uh, while you're waiting for the next person to come in, you could change the way that you're sitting, the way that you're breathing, yeah. and feel the benefit. Absolutely. You know, the, the straw breath in particular, or the box breathing, is such a subtle breathing technique that you can do it in a public place. And when you learn how to do it and practice it regularly, people around you don't even notice you're doing it. And I do it a lot. Um, but there's also other forms of breathing that, that you can use. There's one that's called the bellows breath. That's a bit more obvious. So if you, you, know, you want to do it in the privacy of um, your own room. But yes, I do. I do do these in, in the workplace. And I often 
um, you know, between patients, if I have had a challenging consultation, I will shut the door and I will say to the girls, give me a few moments. Um, and I think they appreciate me when I come out of the room because they know I'm more likely to be um, approachable. I'm more likely to deal with their requests um, and, you know, sort their problems out rather than be sort of stressed from the challenges that I deal with. So yes, it does help. It takes a few minutes um, to do this. And the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and how do you think things are going to going to progress um, in the next few years? Do you think GP well-being will be, become sort of front and centre um, and more of a sort of mainstream part of practice? I hope so. Um, I, I think... For me, this is really about continuing to improve the awareness of wellness at work and to, to lead by example. So there's there's a lot of people that are, you know, very passionate about this, like I am, and they do talk about it openly. They do check in with their staff. They, you know, they do have these honest conversations with the people that they work with. And that raises the awareness of what the problems are and how we could potentially come together to sort of sort them out. So it's important to one, have the conversation and to continue having the conversation. But I also think it's about having flexible work models. So, you know, really emphasizing a meaningful work-life balance where, where you can work remotely, um, you know, do that, but then set those boundaries so that you're not working into very late hours at night or early hours of the morning. Um, and then also sharing the responsibility for the workload that we have as much as we possibly can um, across the wider sort of primary care workforce. You know, we've got more um, uh, paramedics, we've got mental health nurses, for example, practice nurses are brilliant in managing some of the long term conditions that we see in our patients. Um, and it's it's really recognizing the skill set that our wider workforce have and working with them to support our patients in a collaborative um, manner as much as possible. And I think the evolution from practices to primary care networks, perhaps to integrated neighborhood teams, um, really uses that, I think, as a foundation on which I hope we can continue to build. And finally, if, if, you, if you'd like to, would you be able to tell me about somebody who's been an inspiration to you in this area of your work? In the workshops that I do run, there are so many people, participants that come onto these programs that inspire me. And I think the reason for that is that they, they take that step into doing something different about their own mental and emotional health. And I think that's quite inspiring. So, you know, I've had folks that, come onto these workshops, they're very honest, they're very brave, they speak up, um, they're not afraid to put their hands up and say, yes, I need that break, I need to take that step back, I need to look after myself, I want to do something different. And that's really, really inspiring. And I think when they lead the way for others within their teams, within their practices, um, it's a very, very powerful thing. And that is always very inspiring for me. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Farnaz, and um, thank you once again for holding the webinar as well, which was great to see the participation from the, the delegates at the webinar. And um, really interesting to hear your thoughts today and to um, hope that uh, things will, will uh, improve in terms of well-being and that stress levels will go down a bit and collaborative working will be the way forward. So, yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Great. Thanks a lot for having me. Hi, I'm Emma Bauer, editor of the website GP Online and host of the Talking General Practice podcast. If you're interested in what's going on in primary care across the UK, do come and check out our podcast. Talking General Practice is out every Friday and includes discussions about the key issues and news stories affecting general practice and interviews with GP leaders as well as inspiring GPs and others who are making a difference to patient care. Just search Talking General Practice wherever you get your podcasts to have a listen. Welcome back. We are now going to look at three things GPs need to know about delirium. These are taken from a red flags module by Dr. Pippin Singh. Rhiannon, what is our first key point? 
So our first point is that delirium is a manifestation of an underlying pathology, not a diagnosis in itself. So it's important to search for the cause to enable appropriate investigation and management, particularly as the conditions associated with high morbidity and mortality. Also, differentiating delirium from dementia can be difficult, so a good history will be crucial. Our second key point is that delirium can be hypoactive, hyperactive or a mixture of both. Hypoactive delirium might see a patient becoming more withdrawn or drowsy, while hyperactive delirium can mean that the patient is agitated or even aggressive. A challenge with the former is that it can go unrecognised, and a challenge with the latter is that the accompanying aggression could mean a patient is a risk to themselves or others. Our final key point is that you can use the pinch me mnemonic to help you remember the causes of delirium. So, P is for pain, I is for infection, N is for nutrition, C is for constipation, H is for hydration and hypoxia, M is for metabolic and E is for electrolytes. So to recap, delirium is a symptom, not a diagnosis. It can be hyperactive, hypoactive or both. And you can use the pinch me mnemonic to help you remember the potential causes. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Clinical Update podcast. As ever, the content we discuss today will be available on the MIMS Learning website. We hope you will join us next time when we will be speaking to Professor Claire Taylor about early diagnosis and heart failure. Goodbye for now.